Well, 8.32 on site. So I guess there's another 500 attending remote. Uh, yeah, I thought this meant when I first read it that they had registered on site because there's a distinction between yeah. early versus on site. But this means people who are on location. Okay. 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 Good morning, Routing Working Group. Welcome to Seoul. We're about to start our first meeting. And we'll start with chairs, notes, and bashing. Not well. If you haven't read it, please read. Describe how ITF treat IPR. Everything you said and disclosed here is treated with IPR properly. IPR disclosures will ask you twice during working group adoption as well as working group last call for IPR known on the documents. And if we don't receive all answer from all contributors, documents are not progressing. Thanks to note takers and jabber taken by Adrian. Thank you very much. Please sign blue sheets. So, agenda for today. Should we read the agenda probably not, right? Uh, no, I would say, yeah. So, I show the updated charter every time because every time we bring new people, new ideas, we would like to provide a home to work which couldn't be done anywhere else. So this time we are going to talk about Flex E and SD1 space and see where we can progress. The urge from industry is there, lack of interoperability is there. So potentially there's work for us. Status, no new RFCs. So keychain model. Young model has passed working group last call. However, there were some last minute updates. So AC will present it this ATF and then it will go to ISG. Working group last call are ready. Young grip model and VRP models, very stable, well written. Thanks, Shu Feng, for great work. BGP peak has been stuck in response to the shepherd for about two, three months. If anyone from Calder is here, please do respond. Let's, let's be done with the draft. It's been a long time. Uh, remote LFA, not protection. Very good interaction between shepherd and Calders. I believe we'll be ready within a few weeks.
So working group drafts. Multi-hand prefix LFA has passed working group adoption and will be published. Uh, we are waiting for IPR and then it got stuck a bit, but it's ready to, to be the working group document. So I'll take this one. Yep. Uh, so we conducted a working group adoption call on draft Nitish VRP BFD. Um, there were, we don't have consensus on adopting this as a working group document at this point. Uh, the main objection raised uh, was that the working group should be working on solutions that are unencumbered by uh, IPR or available freed implementers. Um, there was discussion on the list following up that that indicates that uh, it's possible that section four is what's covered by the IPR disclosure. Um, and that covers the point to multi-point BFD part of the solution. Uh, it's useful to note that this draft was actually the merge of two documents, which were merged at the request of the working group. Um, original, the Unicast solution version was uh, VRP BFD1, and then the other uh, point to multi-point solution. So a potential solution would appear you know, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there. It's up to uh, the authors and the working group to sort of, you know, put this into action if they think this makes sense. Uh, a potential solution would be to unmerge the drafts, uh, redo the IPR disclosure poll for the new draft, presumably with a, just start with a new name so it has sort of a fresh IPR disclosure section. Uh, redo the IPR disclosure poll and then redo the working group poll. That may be a way to address this and move forward with at least the part of the work that isn't uh, contentious. Uh, okay, Loa Anderson. Um, since I was one of the people bringing this up uh, and I have an interest in another draft, I I think that your solution here is, is okay, because then we will see where uh, the IPR actually apply. The, the problem is that we can't go and look at the IPR today, so we don't know. So that's a, that's a real problem. So we have the same problem in MPLS working group. But if this works, that's a, it's a, a good idea, because then we can start doing something on the MPLS working group document. Okay, so please go ahead and do this. So it's a problem in general because being good citizens, we are trying to get APRs as soon as possible. On other sides, we know it takes about a year to 18 months for APR to show up online. So there's no way for people to look into APR and figure out whether it covers part which are important. So there are numbers of drafts which are not working group documents yet. And Jen? The modern people. You have my slides, right? Morning. I'm Jen Linkova. If you happen to be in V6 Ops guest today, you could continue reading your emails because it will be quite similar. So, quick update on enterprise multi home and draft. We um, yes. can you scroll it a bit down, probably. Sure. So, yeah, first slide is just to remind what we're talking about, because probably not everyone remembers that we spent about an hour in Berlin. And uh, actually, if you look in the slides, on the second slide, there is a link to my presentation from Berlin with all those pictures about what is actually proposed. But the short summary is we uh, need to solve problem of enterprise multi-homing using PA address space 
which means you might have more than one ISP. Each ISP will provide v6 prefix. And then we need to solve two separate, also related uh, problems. First, how to send packet to the correct uplink, which means a to uplink to ISP, uh, which provided the prefix used in a source address. Because uh, we do believe that there are uh, good ISPs that are doing BCP38 filtering. And this is kind of network problem. So router should, should take care of this. And this could be done by a source address dependent routing. But there is another problem how to inform host which address it should use, because in some cases, not all addresses are equal. For example, in case of uplink failure, you basically could not send uh, a packet of uh, that resource addresses from that ISP block anywhere. So host should not use that address and so on. So this is problem of uh, inf influencing uh, address selection algorithm on a host, which uh, could be done by using default address selection algorithm and a particular rule 5.5 of it, and by interacting between interaction between the first hop routers and hosts. So changes made since zero zero version of the draft. Okay, the draft is quite long, right? And it has two big sections. First section is about source address dependent routing and no changes uh, have been made to that section. So all uh, changes are actually in section four, which talks about source address selection on hosts and how hosts get that information from first hop routers and so on. So basically uh, default address selection algorithm and how it could be used, it, it has been clarified a bit. And some reference said that and uh, the main change probably is that it's not only about selecting source address, it's also about selecting other configuration parameters such as DNS resolvers, addresses and search lists because uh, in some scenarios host could not just pick up first DNS uh, server IP from its configuration file and use it because in case of DNS split horizon and other use cases, basically host need to use particular DNS server to uh, get the right answer. In case of wall garden, for example, uh, some uh, DNS, ISP DNS servers might not respond properly if request is coming from internet and not from uh, customers directly. So, so basically there is a section covering this. Uh, briefly, we discussed it yesterday in uh, V6 Ops. So, uh, in Berlin, when we discussed it in V6 Ops, people raised concerns about length of the draft and the fact that default address selection solution heavily relies on Rule 5.5, which is kind of optional for hosts. Not operating system, not all operating system uh, have it implemented. But, but we need it because we're trying to cover most of the scenarios out there. However, there are some scenarios which are quite common and which could be solved even without uh, using rule 5.5. So it could be applicable for almost any hosts which are properly implementing default address selection. RFC and pr probably even without uh, source address dependent routing on the first hop. And we're thinking about forking it into separate draft for V6 ops. Because again, it has nothing to do with routing. It's now just about how to cover uh, one particular but quite common scenario for enterprise multi-homing. So basically to illustrate this, we are going to keep working on this draft and fork one particular use case to a separate draft for V6 ops. Uh, so actually question to working group is, is this work useful? Shall we do it in that way? And ideally I would like to ask if this draft could be adopted in this working group as it is. Uh, yeah. AC Land up Cisco system. 
I heard you say that you could do without source uh, dependent uh, routing. That's only in certain topologies where you don't have a router between yourself and the exit point, or you have uh, the host has a path. If a post has a single default router and it's not, it doesn't have both, it has the wrong exit point, but has another link to get. So it's kind of topology dependent whether you can get away without it. Okay. Uh, we can do it with all these existing features on the vendor, like policy-based routing in the worst case right, scenario. Exactly, right? exactly. You can do it with that. Yeah. yeah so the, again, it's uh, it's not going to be a silver bullet, the second draft I'm talking about. Okay, it's okay. just, it's a thing which we can potentially do right now without making any changes on the host because it's most com most complex part, right? We just want to document that if you have a very simple scenario, you probably can do this thing right now and don't wait for all these uh, nice changes to come to all uh, host operating systems. And, and so I, I can provide a little commentary on the uh, working group adoption and so on. Um, I, I, would, I would favor it. Um, part of the reason that I participated in writing it um, was because mm, about a year ago, we got a request from V6Ops to address this problem. V6Ops can't really do protocol stuff. And a lot of this, the work on this is, about half the work is uh, source test routing related and half is host behavior related. Um, there are many documents in the past and present that address these topics, but I found it very difficult to sort of have an overall picture. So. I helped put together an overall picture, which I hope can function as a sort of a work plan for what needs to be done in um, the routing area and potentially also in, in six man for the host behavior stuff, if anything is required there. Uh, so far as I know, draft doesn't require any changes in host behavior. Okay. Should, should that, so outlining what, what is actually needed from that um, is good. So anyways, um, it, since there are several drafts related to this in various working groups, ISIS and OSPF, uh, as well as a, another draft in here that's already a working group document, uh, this seems like a reasonable sort of roadmap document and overall solution description that would be good if it were under the control of the working group. So <clears throat> to rephrase, uh, chair position is to have draft here and have it adopted here. However, we would like to hear from you whether working group is interested in progressing this work, and if not, why? Let me return the microphone. <laughs> Uh, Frank? Okay, so this should be a brief update on if something's coming up on in situ OEM. Um, so the thing used to be called inband in the first two incarnations of the draft. Uh, we changed the name, and uh, thanks to Eric Nordmark for providing a new and fresh name. In situ, I think, hasn't been used anywhere else. Um, so we can portray the new behavior with a new name now. Um, there is a bunch of Changes that are already visible on this particular slide. Uh, we dramatically increased the number of co-authors uh, for two main reasons. Uh, we are trying to better capture um, the wide variety of data formats uh, that need to go into the packet, um, largely also from a hardware perspective, which is why uh, we have representatives uh, from kind of chip vendors up there. And uh, we started to go and merge the content with uh, Petter Lobkov's draft uh, from Facebook on UDP ping probing. Um, so that these formats got merged into that particular document as well, which is why you've seen the, the list of authors grow significantly. Um, so just to kind of recap on what 
uh, in situ uh, OEM is. Um, I need to go stay here. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. Um, so in this warm and cozy area. Um, so um, what is it? Um, we basically carry information within the user packet as it traverses through the network and gather information in that particular packet. That means we put a piece of, or we use a container, and that container is different across the transport mechanisms that we have. Um, so there is a different container that you need to use with IPv6, and you can use an extension header for that. In VXLAN GPE, you can use another protocol header. In um, SRV6 or NSH, we can use existing uh, TLV type uh, metadata headers uh, to slot that information in. And we are carrying um, operational metadata information and adding to that operational metadata uh, information as the packet traverses through the network. What kind of data do we carry uh, or insert like things like node ID, things like timestamps, things like propagation delay through a particular device or or pipeline, uh, things like um, cryptographic information that prove that a particular node was visited and the likes. Um, so from a deployment perspective, um, we are kind of following a parallel path with this draft, with this raft of drafts, uh, because we're not only trying to do drive the specification here, but in parallel, we're doing an open source implementation as part of the FIDO project and uh, Open Daylight as a controller project, so that these two things go hand in hand um, and we can keep the whole thing in lockstep. Now, so that's the refresher of uh, what we've done in brief um, and also been talking about at the last IETF. Um, now, what changed between uh, last IETF in Berlin and uh, the new version? Um, one th change I already mentioned, uh, that's the change in the name uh, in order to carve out a particular name for this behavior. Because on the one hand side, we're not creating extra traffic, i.e. we're not creating extra packets. Uh, that means it's not clearly out of band, it's not clearly um, something that um, RFC 7799 would classify as out of band. Um, at the same time, we're changing the packet. So it's not entirely passive. Uh, so if you look at 1799, it would probably be hybrid type one. Um, given that we don't want to go and call it always hybrid type one OAM operation, we thought about a more sexy and shorter name and Eric had a very good proposal, I believe, with NC2. Um, as part of the overall thing, we also go and uh, streamlined and properly classified the thing. So there's updates in the, the drafts that make reference to 1799 now. Um, the big change that we've done is we merged the content and we continue to merge the content between Petter's draft on UDP ping probe and um, the information that we already had and the former old uh, 00 and 01 versions. And we've done a bunch of fixes uh, that many of you were pointing out. So thanks to Jen, uh, thanks to Ignos and others who were pointing out uh, nits in the document that helped us dramatically improve the thing. Um, one thing that we also changed, and I'll go and dive into that a little bit in a further level of detail, is what we're doing for proof of transit. Originally, we were just using uh, Shamir secret sharing, uh, which is very lightweight, uh, we're very efficient, but has one particular downside. Uh, and that particular downside is that you cannot preserve the ordering or you can't check whether the ordering or a particular set of nodes was uh, traversed in, this, in the order that you kind of were assuming. Um, for that, we complemented the whole thing with another approach that I'm gonna go dive into in a second. Uh, the second thing is we also dramatically improved on the threat models uh, that Proof of Transit has and um, those Threat models included one that was heavily discussed, and um, that was the problem that, uh, well, you have the proof of transit header and you have the payload, and there is no immediate coupling between the two. That would mean in certain situations an attacker could just take the approved header and swap out the payload in a man, a man of the middle attack, a type of uh, uh, attack. And um, that is something that we fixed uh, that caused quite some kind of conversations on the lists. And um, that is something that we fixed by linking the random part. So the unique identification of the packet, which is also kind of controlled with the operation 
of either nested, nested encryption or some mere secret, uh, secret sharing, we couple that to the payload by making the random number not completely random, but uh, we are providing or using a HMAC of a piece of the packet that is invariant and then link that to the random portion and that way couple the proof of transit header to the payload of the packet so that you can, can no longer swap those things out. Uh, from a data records perspective, we dramatically improved the or, or increased the number of data formats that we're supporting in order to capture the entire variety of use cases that we see across software and hardware implementations, um, as well as the, the probing applications that Patter brought to the table. Um, so um, if you look at the number of uh, data records that we now carry in, in C2 OEM, um, this is what we have. And um, I'm sorry that I didn't really highlight everything that is new in RAT, but I'm trying to go and point that out to you. Um, so. Um, we carry node ID, ingress interface, egress interface, timestamps, and the timestamps got enhanced to have wall clock time and transit delay now, and the wall clock time can be in nanoseconds and uh, seconds, so the format is extended a little. Uh, we have new fields also for queue length, and um, we have a new field for opaque data, and that is again TLV format, so they can, at every single node, drop in a piece of information from memory and then post-process later on. That's largely a piece of alignment that we've done with the UDP pin probe. Um, so the, the opaque data is directly loaned from uh, the, the UDP pin probe from Patterns draft. Um, what didn't change is uh, things for proof of transit and the sequence numbering. Uh, there is another major change that we've done from a processing perspective, given that um, hardware nodes are well, hardware nodes don't really like the original uh, proposal that we had in the, the original versions of the draft where you allocate an array for the entire set of in situ OEM information and then you're updating that array hop by hop or inserting into that array hop by hop. So from a software implementation perspective, that's very efficient because that means you only have to do one copy of for operation of the entire packet at the very beginning, and then you fill the packet, and that pointer operation is relatively cheap in, uh, in, in software. It's just the reverse on, on hardware implementations. Um, expanding the packet is relatively cheap in, in hardware, and then just dropping in the information that you wanna go drop in at a distinct and well-defined point in time um, all the time, that's cheap to do in hardware, which is why we have two operations right now. One, which is software-based or focused on software-based operations where we pre-allocate, and that's the pre-allocated mode that we have in there. And there is another set of operations where we dynamically or incrementally extend the packet. Those two can be happening the same time. So if you have hardware and software nodes, they can choose to do it their way so that, well, you have eventually even two types of header in there, one that is been updated or going to be updated by hardware nodes, uh, hardware capable nodes, other nodes that would update the thing in software would use the, the slightly modified format. Okay, so um, I already promised that um, we added a option and then Stuart, I think you, you, it's only two more minutes and then you can go probably go stand up again. Um, and Stuart, you were inspiring that at the last night, you have saying, well, um, what about well, Samir secret sharing auto preserving. And um, well, we couldn't do that day one. And we said, well, let's go in for those who really require preservation of order. In many cases, people don't really say that that's so much of a requirement, but there are cases, and you brought them up, uh, where that's a requirement. We said, okay, we can go and fix that problem by incrementally or in a kind of nested way encrypt the packet. Um, or portions of the packet, and in our case, it's just encrypting um, or providing a crypto operation on a random on the random field again, and then carrying that across. And at the very end, have the verifier check, kind of check whether the sequence of encryp encryptions is exactly what it should be. That means it's kind of as if you would compose an onion. So you start with something, and then you layer nested encryption one layer over the other, at every single node or service hop that you want to go verify. Um, so we use very much the same set of metadata that we would use for Shamir secret sharing, a random and a cumulative number. Um, in this case, in order to really, well, use um, standard AES, 
we would probably need to make the metadata uh, 256 bits, so two times 128. It's consuming a little bit more than with Shamir secret sharing. And we obviously need hardware that supports, um, well, efficient crypto. So it's a little bit more heavy on both the use of metadata as well as on the compute side, but we can preserve the order. And that's another thing that we documented as part of the draft. Um, so uh, a little bit of a kind of a, an announcement for uh, what we're going to do on, uh, in Bits and Buys on Thursday. We're going to go show a couple of demos. Um, starting from the right-hand side, um, originally we were just demoing um, from an open source implementation perspective what we can do with IPv6 and extension headers to carry inbound OEM information. By now we have support for the very same thing with a protocol header and GPE. GP. And uh, even in VXLAN GPE, we update the header at transit nodes so that you have visibility of the quote unquote underlay if you want to. Um, in addition, we're going to go and demo an application using inbound OEM now, very much the same way as what Header had with the UDP probe, um, where we're kind of probing an entire network and trying to understand which links work and which links won't work. And uh, on the very left hand side, uh, the demo will be called. M anycast or multicast anycast or whatever. It's combining inbound OEM with segment routing to do intelligent anycast. So um, if you have a, an anycast server selection scenario um, and you want to go pick the best server, be it from a load perspective or be it from a uh, server to client delay perspective, what we do is we piggyback inbound OEM information or in situ OEM information, I've got to go correct myself, onto the SYN and SYNAC in order to understand the delay parameters. And then we're choosing and nailing the connection to the one that we believe is the most obvious, uh, obvious or, or best uh, using segment routing. Uh, so all of that will be kind of shown on uh, in, in bits and bytes on Thursday. Now, um, I had a bit of a chat uh, yesterday with uh, the ops area directors and they were voicing a kind of moderate interest uh, to go and swing the work, even if it's largely operational based, uh, to uh, or into OPS AWG. Um, so they voiced a bit of a preference to land the work there as opposed to an RT uh, RTG. We don't really have a preference. We just want to land it somewhere, uh, which is why I said, well, likely we're going to land it there, but I want to go still here, see here, uh, here kind of the, the opinion of this working group. Uh, where we would go and best progress the work. Um, the reasoning behind that is it is really operations that we're doing. Um, so it does make sense to land it there, given that, well, there is protocol aspects, absolutely. Uh, there is also aspects with regards to overlay OEM, uh, and we can use the container that the overlay OEM uh, design team has defined to go and carry the data formats that we have. So that aligns very well. Um, but yeah, well, I absolutely want to go hear opinions and I see, uh, well, Greg and, and Elia lining up to probably no, uh, provide a point on that. But maybe Stuart one, wants Stuart, to get up Stuart, again Stuart. first and, and sorry for keeping you standing for so long. So I'd like to go back uh, to the first Stuart, slide, which is where I was. Stuart Brown. I want to go back to the first slide. Let me see whether I can go do that. So we've got this, go, uh, the next slide. That's it. We've got this shim layer that's going to provide OA, a, a, a universal OAM um, system. What I don't understand is what happens to ECMP in this network. Now we've added that there because there, there seems to be it seems to be quite hard to get to the five tuple. Very few people are ECMPing on anything else, and the size of some of those fields is going to make it enormous. By the time you've gone through um, sure. multiple IPv6 addresses, multiple extra um, things for um, segment routing, you know, you'll be sort of off the end of the packet before you can even get to the five tuple. Um, it is a concern. Um, so the, I think the, the delicate situation that we're dealing with is specification and reality here. Uh, from a specification perspective, you should be able to do that, right? And there is hardware that is properly capable of finding the, alpha, uh, the L4 information, even if you have a chain of extension headers in front of you or whatever, right? It does exist. Software does that brilliantly. Does all the hardware do that brilliantly? Uh, maybe not. And the variety is quite huge out there on what happens if you put even extension headers in into an IPv6 packet or any other 
tunneling encapsulation. What happens to ECMP? I think it's, well, there's a wide variety out there. Uh, should we just go and constrain ourselves based on the constraints on the current hardware? I don't believe so, because then new protocols would never, ever happen. V6 would never, ever happen if we say, well, we got to go and support only the chipsets that we have at hand today. Because back in 99, we wouldn't have specified IPv6 in that case. Right? So, so let's do the right thing. And without, hopefully the chipset vendors have. Well, without getting down one up. more point. Yes. The two guys that we have on the graph, so maybe let's go for to, to the first page. They don't say it's not a problem. So not all hardware vendors have the same problem. Um, so, you do have to live in a real world with I build deployments that. with not very many greenfield uh, new deployments, which means that you do have to be, a, be at least reasonably backwards compatible uh, in the way you introduce these things. And indeed, uh, groups that think about backwards compatibility from day one do best, which is perhaps why we're taking so long to get V6 deployed. Fair point. Uh, uh, Greg Mursky. Um I'm concerned uh, with their, um, especially with this uh, incremental uh, increase of the size of the metadata uh, and uh, MTU. So um, the egress that initiates this um, in situ OEM would not know uh, the uh, resulting the maximum uh, metadata size that will be end up. So the packet may exceed MTU somewhere in flight and will be dropped. Uh, you suggest that this error has to be uh, logged, which to me is the uh, DS vector. So you, you introduce uh, the security concern and scaling concern for some questionable functionality. So. Um Point well taken. Um, the concern that you're raising is exactly the concern why we didn't have that in the 00 and 01 version of the draft. Um, so you got to be very cognizant of what you're doing if you're doing the incremental stuff. Um, that said, from a hardware perspective, you're creating a huge benefit if you do the incremental in uh, increase. So. I, we do understand the concern. Um, whether we want to go carry forward with that, um, I'm myself a bit on the fence. Um, there is authors, and maybe we can have the, the people like Tal or David speak up, um, that were very much in favor of doing the incremental stuff because it helps hardware quite a bit. And um, let's see how the overall thing progresses and whether we want to keep, co keep that option or not. I, I just want to mention that uh, there is alternative uh, solution to that, which does not introduce these problems. Um, if you want to go and bring them up on the list or even here, then we would be more no, than welcome it, for a hardware friendly. For now, for this approach. session, it's too long, so we okay. can go discuss it on the list. Let's take that offline then. Thank you. Hi, Adrian Farrell. <clears throat> uh, I agree with you uh, that some hardware is really good at looking long way down the packet and uh, uh, and doing deep inspection and c could solve the ECMP stuff, but some hardware can't. Um, uh, and so it seems to me that your proposal is that we develop a new OAM system that can only be used in new networks and, and can't be applied back into existing networks. Is that what? Well, it depends, right? So it depends on what your deployment domain is. Um, so if you have a uh, system, well, like a new system, ACK, right? Uh, but even if you look at overlay scenarios, maybe you just want to use that type in an overlay situation where um, what you want to go do is do an SLA check on something that uses VXLAN GPE as a tunneling protocol. And then you piggy pack that information into VXLAN GPE in order to do time stamping of sure, the packets. Sure. So I think you don't have to apply and use the whole slew of things that are outlined here, right? Maybe you only want to go do things like proof of transit in a service function chaining environment in order to make sure that all the packets go through the sequence of firewalls. 
Um, we are proposing something that is relatively universal and generic, especially by kind of the slew of different authors that you've seen now kind of contributing to this system, like you call it. And um, so you're not forced to do everything in every scenario. And in certain cases, we are not growing the packet dramatically, right? So we're just growing the packet by 128 by a bits. Um, that's less than an IPv6. And um, maybe I think you have a solution in that space and it's a fixed header where even existing chipsets, and we know that, can do it. Yeah, so I, I, I don't buy your line of argument that this is totally generic um, and you can only use some of it in some places and if you try to do other things, it simply won't work. Um, and I'll give you a, a case in point. The um, proof of transit document um, could substantially grow the size of the header, clearly, as you encrypt at each stage. Um, uh, and that document does mention MTU. Uh, and MTU is clearly a concern for that approach. Unfortunately, that document only mentions MTU in the terminology section. So we, we need to, to go a little further and, and understand if this is a gen generic approach to OAM, then we ought to be able to use it generically. If it's not a generic approach to OAM, if it's specific, you can use this function in this type of network and that function in that type of network, we need to be really clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fair point. Aliyah Atlas. So three things. First, thank you for bringing the work. It is interesting and it's certainly provoking some good discussion. Second, um, I need to talk to Benoit and others yeah, to do. <laughs> nailed. Well, <laughs> we were working on it. Um, it's the implications of this and the need to understand a number of details about how a lot of the routing, forwarding, hardware, and so on works. I mean, Stort's concern about ECMP, I mean, there are ways it could be handled, right, that might need to be discussed, but understanding what the implications are and the fact that it's protocol work, I'm... Mm. There's always cross area stuff, so I need to talk to Benoit. I don't, I don't feel like Ops AWG is quite the right fit. Um, but I do think we need to get do something. It, it feels to me, and I'm interested to hear from the room more on interest in this the OAM space. It feels like there's a number of ideas. Um, swirling around that need focus. Okay, thank you. AC Lindum Cisco Systems. I think this is really too big to fit here, and I think it e either needs to be kicked back to ops or in a separate working group. Thank you. All right. So so one comment from my side, uh, that there's a number of drafts being discussed which expose particular capabilities of hardware. So being able to push number of things, being able to read entropy fields. So maybe looking into how you could reuse same work by pushing hash at ingress node, which could be read by every node in transit and use it for entropy somewhere closer. It could be useful and make life easier. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, so more. You could, sure. Uh, you could increase your encapsulation by putting a convenient UDP header in front of it and at least load balance off that. We can also do that, and that's probably also something that uh, there is one thing that we right had up here. Uh, we're working on or trying to find a way to go and get the whole thing working for IPv4. And for IPv4, you're probably and required to use another UDP header with another IP header in front because where else do you put the information? And maybe we'll want to follow exactly that path. But at least but you do need to address ECMP. This, I think, will just crash and burn if you uh, and just waste everyone's time unless you upfront figure out how to make it work in existing networks. And um, you know, ECMP, is, ECMP and addressing are the two classic ways of determining whether a project is viable. And I don't think this one passes the ECMP test. Well, I believe we can get that to work. Um, OK, thanks. 
Thank you very much. So we are uh, five minutes ahead of schedule, uh, but it's it's time for uh, we can start with Guarab's presentation. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, myself, Gaurav Agrawal. Okay, and today I will be talking about our draft related to MRT FRR with segment routing. So, okay. so as we all know, MRT is an FRR technology which is capable of providing 100% coverage in node and link failures for IP LDP traffic. It's a well proven technology which has reference implementations available in the industry. And both the MRT architecture and the algorithm is an RFC now. So what we are proposing over here is to reuse the existing work, which is already being done for the MRT for the segment routing. It's not okay. Okay, so uh, there has been some significant changes from the uh, since the 02 versions. Uh, I would like to thank Chris for his valuable feedbacks and suggestions over the draft. One of the major changes since the 02 version is the use of the algorithm field instead of the IGP based MTID for the advertisement of the MRT red and the MRT blue labels. So along with that, we have defined two new additional algorithm values corresponding to MRT red and MRT blue. And a new MRT profile has been defined for the segment routing. Okay, let me quickly introduce the steps involved uh, to make MRT FRR with segment routing work. So the first step is to uh, define a new SR MRT profile and use the existing IGP extensions for the MRT to exchange the same. The second step is to define two new SR algorithm fields corresponding to the red and blue and use the existing IGP extensions for the SR to carry the same in the algorithm TLV or sub TLV for uh, uh, basically SR MRT capability exchange. On the same ground, um, uh, the existing IGP extensions for the SR will be reused to carry the uh, new labels corresponding to the MRT red and the MRT blue. And the last step is basically the SR nodes needs to uh, support forwarding topology creations and the MRT FRR using the MRT algorithm. So what um, message I wanted to give over here is like basically we can see with very little additional efforts, we are able to extend MRT FRR for the segment routing. Okay, so this is just an example to show how the MRT FRR will work with the destination based SR. So uh, each and every node needs to advertise three different labels corresponding to the default red and blue. Uh, the ingress will uh, take the uh, destination default label to forward the traffic in case of any failure. As we can see in this topology, there is a failure between 1002 to 1004. The 1006 label, which is a default label, will be swept with 6006, which is a red label. So uh, then the traffic will be forwarded till the egress node. On the similar grounds, MRT FRR can be used for the traffic engineered uh, segment routing also. So again, each and every device will advertise three labels. And in case of any failure, the outermost segment label will be exchanged with the corresponding red or blue label. So this is how uh, basically the MRT FRR will work for the segment routing. So uh, what is our next step? Uh, 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 basically, we need to still analyze the solution wherein we have to uh, support the destination prefixes outside the MRT island in the scenarios when the MRT island is not same as an IGP area, that is the partial deployment scenario. That is one aspect we are working on it right now. And also we are working together with the authors of the draft bank to come to a common draft there is another draft on the same idea. So we are trying to collaborate and have a single unified draft on that. And I would like to request the community feedback and suggestions on the draft because still we are working on it. So we would like to hear more from the community on the same. 
Thank you. That's it from my side. So what's the intention with Draft Bank to merge? Uh, uh, basically, we are um, the solution for to support the destination outside the MRT island. That is something we don't support as of now. Draft Bank has a solution for that. So we are trying to have a unified way to have it. Thank you. Thank you. Robin? I just saw him walking out of the door. We're running uh, 10 minutes early, so you're up, uh, Robin. Okay. Let me find your thoughts. Okay. Just one second. Can okay, thank you. How how long can I get? <laughs> Please stop me in time, okay? Because uh, Robin is always a uh, waste of time. Okay. You asked for ten minutes. So okay. 10 minutes. Okay. So I I explain this one. Sorry, uh, I run this uh, Robin uh, from Huawei. Okay, I'm I'm sleeping now because I whole night no sleep. Okay, please do not challenge me too much. Okay, now I will talk to this one. This is an interesting topic. This is the architecture of network artificial intelligence. In fact, this topic has been presented in the SDRG. Okay, so now that a lot of work has been done in the SDN and NFV industry. But now I think I like to propose these uh, ideas. Okay, so I think this will help us to maybe uh, move on based on my and my team's research in the SDN and the NFA areas. Okay, next one. Okay, this introduction, the first is the artificial intelligence now is popular in the IT industry related, IT, IT industry related uh, business such as with the famous is Google AlphaGo, is beat the human. Okay, everyone knows this is the exploded news. Okay, other this one also says a great example based on artificial intelligence. But now it's time for the network. Okay, we use the artificial intelligence for the network. We call it as network artificial intelligence. But here we have proposed several this one, several the examples, uh, use case, is that based on this, the big data collected from the network. So then we can do some of this, the machine learning, machine learning. Then we based on the failure patterns. So then based on the decision tree. So then we can implement the following use cases. The first one is the self adjustment of the network. Second one is the self-optimization. Now that the typical use case is the PCE work in the TIS working group and also the, and also the PCE working group. So a lot of uh, solutions based on these solutions, the PCE uh, centralized traffic optimization is being deployed in the industry. But we think we can get more work on this one. We can collect more data from this network and make our network. This is intelligent, intelligent self, uh, intelligent optimization. Uh, third one is self recovery because now our the network, though we always think our the IP network is robust, but I tell the truth, our the network, in fact, is very fragile. Okay. And the IGP flooding in the network make our network 
is uh, flapping, but nobody can locate the root cause. <laughs> yes, I see. Okay, you know the user case. Okay, your error. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so, but now, but based on the network artificial intelligence, we can immediately find the root cause of the IGP. Okay. And the next one is the traffic of monitoring and the failure location, okay? Because you can collect more network data and more network states, so you can get this one, okay? Next one is the traffic prediction, okay? Based on the past big data of the traffic, we can predict, predict the future traffic. So then we can determine the traffic policy. Okay, so this draft is just the early phase. So we define the architecture uh, of the NAI, including the reference model, key components, and uh, the protocol extension requirements. Because this topic is the transition between the new error, uh, older error to the new error. Because some work will, I think, have to be done in the working groups. Some work needed to be done research working groups, uh, research research groups. So that's why I proposed in two, uh, in the SDRG and in the RTG working group. Okay, so this is our thinking on the roadmap of our the SDN world. Okay, in fact, for the past years, some people think OpenFlow will replace the world. But after several years, we found it not happens. Okay, so now, in fact, it's just the plus SDN. Okay, we have the traditional, this is the tr traditional traffic engineering, but the plus SDN centralized the traffic optimization. We get the smart network. Sorry, this one work? Okay, this smart traffic engineering. And also we have the traditional service provision, but it's time consuming and uh, error prone. But now plus SDN centralized automated service provision, so this instant service, okay, we get revenue faster for our carriers. Robin, you're on third slide in six minutes. Yeah, I know. You've got Okay, I can finish it, believe me. Okay, <laughs> I will finish and I run. Okay, and no, 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 no issue. I will not feed back any comments. How this traditional OEM, so plus SDN, so have the intelligent OEM. Because now we have complex OEM mechanisms. For example, that is the layer two OEM, layer one OEM, layer three OEM, uh, layer four to layer seven OEM for our net engineering engineer is a very, it's a hard work to locate with so many mechanism. But even so, we think that we still lack, lack of a lot of mechanism because the lack of the mechanism cause us very difficult to locate the failures. So we call it intelligent OER. Then this is the SDN application happens in independent area. But now, Huawei, uh, Huawei, in the SDRG, we propose the SDNI, multiple SDN controller solution. In the industry, we call it as, uh, some call it the controller federation, some call it the hierarchical uh, controller. But we propose the use case, is seamless MPRs for mobile backhaul. This is a typical use case is done by my team. So that is verify this is the end-to-end -end traffic optimization in the seamless MPRs scenario. So now I think it's a time network artificial intelligence. Though we do a lot of work in the past year, but now network artificial intelligence is introduced we think we are still in the early phase of our the new network error. Okay, that's my suggestion. Because in the artificial intelligence, the 
the average of the artificial intelligence is just achieved the age of the human is the three years old. But Google, some of these big guys, they can achieve seven years old. But now I think for the network artificial intelligence, maybe just only one year old. So people, we are fortunate. We are fortunate. We can get work to be done last 20 years to make our the net, network artificial intelligence to achieve the age of 20, maybe. Robin, you need to progress if you wish to finish your presentation. Okay, I finish. So this is a reference main, uh, model. Okay, I think this is a central controller is a key point, the key point. So now this is the brain of the network. You think what your brain can do, so you can understand the network brain can do a lot of things, flooding idea. So this is the reference model. We give the four components. One is a central controller, then is a network device. Because you want to get more intelligence, need the support from your device, provide more mechanisms to help the brain to collect more data and states. And this one is southbound protocol and models of a controller. You need to collect huge data from the network. So now SMP NetConf is not performance, is not okay. We must introduce some high performance protocols. And this one, northbound model of controller. Though machine learning, artificial intelligence is complex, but the northbound model should be simple for the users. Okay. So this is the requirement of the protocol extension. The first one, this is the new southbound protocol should be introduced. Then that the model of the element should be uh, completed to collect more network states. And then new OM mechanism should be introduced. And then this is the new models of the network elements should be introduced as a new OAM mechanism introduced. Okay, so this one is the south northbound abstract model should be introduced. Okay, everyone, if you like, I challenge. Okay, so this is the his, uh, sorry. Uh, I believe he used wrong slides to finish. So this is the last slide. No, uh, this is not my, oh, sorry. In fact, I have uh, used the, we have finished the prototype. Sorry, uh, maybe I finished this one. In fact, we also, the open source work is being done in the owners, okay? And also, we will do this one in the running code to make it happen, okay? So if you like, please refer to my slides in SDNRG. That's the complete one. Okay, this is the next step we determine the right working group, R RG, to do. Okay, so that's all. Okay, thanks. Okay. I think there are Only one comment I can answer, Hannes. <laughs> okay, I can like to talk to you. Okay, I, because I'm Archie now is very tired for you. If you like these ideas, I can buy your dinner, okay? <laughs> okay, Hannes, what's your comment? Okay, okay. Um, Hannes Gredler, RT Brick. Um, I know that ITF documents have the tendency to be rather, uh, I would say, sparse, right? Uh, but four pages for uh, an architecture definition is a little bit too small for my taste. Yeah, you are right. But um, the running code. Suggestion would be. <laughs> suggestion would be, uh, I mean, if you read through your text of your draft, it's full of assertions, uh, but it is not how you have come up with the conclusions. So I, there's no reason to write a PhD here, but uh, a little bit more of the whys behind your reasoning wouldn't hurt. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I will answer your other comments. The first one, I think uh, the... Text is short, but I think the idea is innovative. I also tell you this one because I think the slice means one slice. We, per, in fact, we have already finished the prototype. Prototype. So I think we use as the open source 
for the big data and also Hadoop, Spark, and also the Elastic Search, and also with the ELK that we do this the syslog, do the syslog. We based on the syslog to the intelligence. So, so I, I think Hannes was giving some good advice about the text, and you could address that in the text. Uh, let's let's move on to the next question. Uh, okay. Dan Bogdanovich Volta. My question would be: You're saying you have to define a new protocol with all the protocols that we have available and some of the open source one, couldn't you find the reasons what are the existing one lacking and then maybe propose extensions. If you cannot propose those extensions, then make, then say for these reasons, we cannot use any existing protocols and this is the reason why we are going with a new protocol with the suggestion of a new protocol. Thank you. Uh, uh, Greg Merskin, actually I, I, I will second that. Um, and I will point to um, the way how um, overlay OEM uh, documents came about. So we first uh, originated generic requirements and then went to gap analysis, and that draws conclusion into the gaps and whether it's, uh, as suggested, extensions or some pieces they're missing. I think that that would be a uh, more, that will be a reasonable approach. All right, I will communicate with you. Stefan Nikowski from Orange. What you are presenting uh, looks like kind of autonomic networking, and I think there are already some work on this. No? Sorry, I know. It looks like autonomic networking. Automated? Autonomic. Automated. Okay. Autonomic. Yeah. Anima working group, yes. Uh, sorry, I cannot catch your point. So after the, the presentation, I will talk to you, okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, sorry you for can, my sleepy, okay. You can put Mike in there. Uh, so, Mahesh. The PDF, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've got latest. Uh, so uh, there's an updated version which is going to be presented. The uploader to the site was crashing in yesterday, so there could be a bit of discrepancy. I'll try to upload new document after the meeting. Thanks. Uh, we just ran out of time on Friday. Sorry, what was it? Because oh. I'm not there. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm Mahesh, and I have a couple of my co-authors on MeetEcho, so they will probably correct me if I go completely off slides. Um, this work uh, started off in uh, NetMod Working Group, but I guess it was felt that this probably uh, group working group would probably be the right place to be talking about it. Um, so a little bit of history on this. Uh, we started with first proposing a QoS, uh, sorry, a DiffServe Yang model. The result of it was that uh, people asked, so what if I want to um, have a model for uh, L2 costs or a model based on 802.1p. Um, so what we had to do was to first come up with what we call a base set of models that would span um, all possible QoS uh, Yang models. It's a bit of a challenge to try to define a Yang model um, not only across vendors, but even within vendors across different platforms. So trying to come up with a Yang model that kind of covers everything has suddenly been a challenge and it will continue to be as you will see. So we started with basically defining four sets of base models that we believe uh, 
will cater to the base requirements of all the models. And then we start to build upon them, particularly for diff serve uh, in this particular draft. So what the diff server uh, Yang model does is it takes the base classify Yang model and then adds anything that's specific to diff serve, like DSCP um, code points, the definition of source and destination IP address, uh, source and destination port and protocol. Similarly for policy, action and target, anything that's specific to diff serve then goes into the diff serve uh, Yang model. Um, and because of the challenges between vendors trying to implement their version of the Yang model, we allow for a whole uh, vendor specific section that then augments the base models to add their own specific queuing and advanced queue management specific parameters. Um, as I said, uh, mainly the update between the last uh, and this is a name change to reflect the change in the working group. Um, the second aspect was that uh, there was an existing Yang model um, draft Chen that was in routing working group. And the authors have come together and are working towards combining the two drafts. Towards that effort, company C, we call it company A, B, and now C model has been added to the vendor specific section. What we are still working towards is more common uh, information that we feel that can go into the base and diff serve model. There's a bit of going back and forth on what we believe we can still put in the base model. Um, there's work around interface bindings. Uh, we need more agreement between the three vendors, at least, that are working on the model on handling multiple um, policies of the same type on an interface. Um, there is work, we have some statistics, but we need um, to add support for reading statistics, specifically for classifier and queue. And then um, every vendor has information that they want to pass between input and output interface through metadata that we need to, to be able to define. And that's pretty much an update. Why? <laughs> okay, go ahead. AC Lindum, Cisco Systems. Ida, as somebody who worked on the problem of harmonizing different line cards in a, and the QoS in a different uh, company, uh, you know, easy chip uh, and two generations of uh, yeah. pro pro proprietary ASICs, I would support this work. I like the way you've done and you've taken the pieces that can be common and put them in separate models. And then you have those extensive examples. I think this is, we should take this work. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I agree with AC. And uh, uh, also the policies are highly uh, vendor specific. And actually the policies are highly vendor specific and hardware specific. And that has to be taken into the account because some of the same policies you cannot apply on the same vendor because of the different line cards. Um, I'm pretty familiar. I haven't read absolutely the latest, but I'm pretty familiar with the, the uh, with the draft and with the model. So um, just even thinking about you know leaving it as a separate one and just type defining it as a base mod, you know, as as the base elements for the QoS would be very helpful. All right, thanks. Oh, yeah, Atlas. Yeah, this is the right working group. We've discussed with the transport area. Uh, normally, this is something that would go into the transport area working group, but they feel like routing has the combination of skill set to make it work. Um, I think there are a lot of challenges in reconciling the different line card capabilities and policies, but I'm happy to see the work happening. All right, thanks. David Black, Transport Area Working Group Chair, got up here to plus one to everything Aliyah just said. Excellent. Full consensus. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, coming from my side, the upstate changes been quite disruptive, whole discussion about 
up and config versus ITF. So now we are hearing notifications versus RPCs discussion. Would be really good to figure out and provide guidelines when to use what, so you don't need to change your drafts. And across ATF, we could propose single solution. So I'll bring back those issues, not issues, but really need to decide what we do on Friday when Louis is here, and we should come up with recommendation. In right. your case, there's a lot of information going back to the client, right? So you need to use right mechanisms to provide it. Right. So yes, we are waiting on the recommendation from Net the NetMod working group on um, Upstate to see what changes we might need to make to the model. Thank you for the great work. Yeah. So one last comment. So this it seems like there's general agreement about adopting this general work and so on. Um, we we need, of course, to do a uh, an adoption poll and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, would when would you have a draft that you would think would be the right draft to uh, to run an adoption poll on? Right. So I think in terms of the next steps that we identified, um, the commonality in the base model for classifier and policy is something that we are debating. We hope to resolve that in the next couple of months. So probably the next update of the draft would probably be the right time to make a call on a work group adoption. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Linda. So following presentation is falling under extended charter of routing working group and we would like to bootstrap discussion about SD1 space discrepancy in control place and data planes and maybe help them to come up with something which can be interoperable and makes life better. My name's Linda Dunbar from Huawei. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about um, um, uh, we call it uh, Cloud VPN, um, or the industry has been calling it uh, SD1. Okay, so most people probably have heard of SD1 has been so um, hot in the industry because many enterprises believe that uh, they can suddenly just put uh, the same CP on the on the edge and boom, they get a network and they can bypass the MPLS um, VPN network. They can bypass lots of things and provide all the services they need. Um, um, so the architecture I started with um, many enterprises used to be fixed locations. You create the VPN among the locations. But as more and more enterprises are using um, a data center, a cloud data center for some of their uh, sites or some of their content, so more and more need to be able to establish uh, the VPN to the uh, cloud. And uh, so with that, um, uh, this uh, um, SD1 comes. Um, uh, so the what is SD1? Um, based on Gartner, their definition of SD1 is really being able to multiplexing different kinds of uh, underlay network. So your underlay network, you could have a VPN already, L3 VPN being built, and uh, then your client need to increase capacity, and uh, you put those thin CPE there so that traffic can be bridged between those two. Some of the high priority traffic goes through the MPLS based VPN, and some of less important traffic goes through um, the uh, uh, internet. And uh, some of the service providers use this as a, um, a way to uh, determine if they need to expand their um, core capacity for VPN. They can expect first put a or SD1 um, uh, on the customer edge as the traffic become more steady and as the uh, provide uh, the customer need to uh, willing to pay for long term commitment. Then they can increase the um, the uh, the core MPLS based L3 VPN. So um, for the um, Gartner defined SD1, and but that is like a um, enterprise uh, service uh, customer kind of um, 
viewed as the um, the one network. Um, but for a provider to provide those uh, kind of uh, uh, private network uh, with SLAs, um, it is more than just establishing tunnels among the edge nodes. And uh, the for provider to provide those SD1, um, first of all, they need some kind of uh, SLA. And uh, also, they need to be able to bond this overlay with the underlay network. And um, um, as um, um, Edge, uh, the SYN CPE can be floating from one data center to another data center, and they will be able to dynamically bond them together. Another thing is uh, being able to have um, uh, the virtual function or physical function being instantiated to um, ensure um, client-based policies can be QoS policies, can be um, uh, security policies, can be value-added services. Um, so those are all included in the provider provided SD1. So it's more than the just the SD1. Okay, so the key differences. Um, uh, because um, internally we have to face that. Um, we have um, uh, L3 VPN, L2 VPN, and this uh, SD1. What are the key differences? Um, uh, first of all, the L3 VPN, L2 VPN uh, are based on MPLS, right? It's MPLS based network. And uh, also the sites are uh, limited. You're talking about 50 nodes size, 100 nodes, or 500 nodes. But when you come to SD1 or the cloud VPN, um, the size can be much, much larger. One of our customers telling us for their virtual access router, or we call SYNCPE, they are talking about in a magnitude of 50,000. The number may be too high, but in terms of number, it's much higher. And uh, the from client perspective, they don't see any kind of routing protocol. All they see is they have SYN CPEs, they connect them together, and they, they define the, the, the QoS policies. They define the value-added services. Um, they don't even worry about where those functions are instantiated. Those are all transparent. Um, and uh, so they don't worry about CE to PE interaction, those routing protocols. So the reason I bring this uh, presentation here, um, this is just a zero zero version, um, is really to stimulate more discussions. Um, and uh, um, because um, for the SD1, many people will say, hey, there's nothing to be done, it has been deployed already. Um, but the truth is, if you're talking about SD1 from provider, service provider's perspective, be able to provide those service with SLA. Actually, there are lots of work to be done uh, from um, uh, routing area. Um, to begin with, um, so we have um, um, uh, so many tunnels. If we talk about 10,000 end nodes, you're talking about lots and lots of tunnels, different encapsulations. And then there's also like a control plan. For example, you need to discover all the endpoints whether the endpoint can support your um, um, in needed encapsulation. Maybe if you want to build a tunnel between A and B, and uh, the A support uh, GIE encapsulation and B support GUI en encapsulation, and then how do you build tunnel between them? And also um, from control plan point of view, um, it's being able to dynamically bond kind of find those uh, overlay with the underlay. Um, so um, um, also there's um, the data plan and uh, how do we monitor it and how do we do the fault in um, isolation. And there are some existing work actually done already. There is uh, some RFC, there's an arrow link. Um, down many, many years ago, um, maybe over 10 years ago, there are some new things being discussed in that draft. So many of the work, well, <laughs> many of the um, areas, uh, the, the problems addressed by those uh, arrow link actually are applicable to uh, SD-1. The, the, 
Aerolink, um, I'm not saying their work is 100% correct or anything, but those are the issues need to be addressed. Here, just list a few, right? Basically, the interface, um, the endnote characteristics, okay? And uh, there are also the, the route discovery. And uh, uh, there's some another uh, uh, work, it's about uh, the uh, ma moms, noms, the protocol, and they also listed a bunch of um, um, issues. Um, I think those has to be addressed. So there are lots of problems. I'm bringing this um, draft here mainly to stimulate some discussions and to look at all the problems um, associated with SD Wang and be able to maybe narrow down to a few that uh, we as a community can address them, uh, either using our existing protocol, existing approach, I'll be maybe able to have some kind of extension. And uh, so the next step is um, we are looking for people who are interested in this area and uh, maybe um, send emails um, talking about it. And that's uh, the purpose of this uh, presentation. Any questions? No questions. So looking around, I see both people who consume this kind of services as customers, as well as people who are building this kind of services. Uh, most companies usually started with build first, standardize later. So I believe we are close to second phase and especially consumers of the technology now facing lack of interoperability. Imagine you're building LTVPN and your BGP implementation just doesn't interrupt. So we are getting close to this kind of situation it would be really good if both sides, so the selling side and buying side would come together and propose solution which work for everybody. We don't want to push it through the throat. We IT have defined solution, you have to implement it. We would like to come up with a solution which provides interoperability at high level, which provide translation from intent into maybe something proprietary that works for everybody. So contribution discussion at least would be more than welcome. So, uh, Stuart's up, but do you have a comment, Daisy? AC Lindem, uh, Cisco Systems. I'm not an expert in this area, but I know that, you know, there's a number, like you, like Jeff was saying, there's a number of solutions in this area. And a big question is going to be what, and, and since they're completely overlays, they're completely private and don't really need to standardize. So it would be good to say what parts need to be standardized and what parts don't need to be for something like this. And possibly, I, I, I guess what we're looking for is a, a, a standards-based overlay network. Like an or, uh, SD SD or no, I wouldn't I won't call it SD WAN. I'll talk, I'll say a standards based uh, overlay. Over, overlay VPN. Is that what we're looking for? So I would say there are a few parts. Number one, I think most important one is a data model. How do you describe service? So at least from consumer perspective, they could define their service. It could be then instantiated in possibly a proprietary way. Number two. If you look at number of encapsulation used, you name a name, it's there. So you cannot really put two devices from different vendors on the same service. So we are facing the same issues we had in the 1990s. It's just another space. Yes. There's nothing up there yet. It's warming up. Sorry? It's warming up. Ah, OK. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the way I'd like to do this before we start is um, I, I put the slides together. I wrote the draft to put this with uh, put some slides together, um, and then after I put them together, I had some feedback from AC and Les. And so what I'd like to do is to present this and then uh, throw their feedback in to one of the several ways forward, if that's an acceptable way to proceed. Uh, so what moves me forward? Right, that's it. Right. So. Um, a long time ago, when I was active in um, Fast Reroute, um, we had we realized that you needed to have um, 
a timer mechanism to uh, decide in, in, for all the routers in the network when they could move to the next stage of the fast reroute um, uh, reconvergence transition. And um, Mike Shander, Leah, and I wrote a, a draft that described this. But when the work didn't, didn't uh, proceed, we kind of sort of let it go fallow. And well, MRT has come along since, and MRT needed a timer. Uh, for exactly the same um, sort of purpose, to for all the nodes in the network to know um, when they had reacted to um, the event and uh, reprogrammed their fib accordingly. Um, so the authors sort of spoke to 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 me about this old piece of work and whether it should be pulled out of MRT and live on its own. And uh, it certainly occurred to me that. If we're going to write a draft to do this, did we need to write a draft that dealt with the concept of parameter synchronization? When I say parameter synchronization, these would, would previously have been invariants in the network. And invariants are something you, you can't really change. And the question is, do we need to have a mechanism to sort of kind of change the agree amongst all the nodes in the network that they can change any of these uh, really fixed parameters? So. Um, I mean, the alternatives are you know, to, to doing some sort of vote in the network are um, that you bake the constants into the protocol. Uh, they stay there forever, um, the, which it can be difficult if there's a hardware dependency, which there is in this particular case. Um, we could do manual configuration, static configuration, or uh, SDN configuration. Again, possibly a bit difficult if you need to get to the SDN controller over the protocol whose parameter you're thinking of fixing. Um, or we could get a, 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 um, a node to flood it, uh, uh, to around the network um, what it would like the parameter to be, and then have a voting mechanism. So the idea is that each node floods its, per, its preferred parameter value. Each node supporting um, this knows what the selection algorithm is, because clearly, depending on what the parameter is, it could be biggest, largest, smallest, whatever. Um, then there's no negotiation. I mean, you, it works just like any other link state sort of thing. You, you flood the information. You trust everyone to do the right um, thing. In this particular case, we're thinking of picking a timer value, but one could imagine other possible parameters. Um, there, you need some rules about when you use it. Um, and um, you know, our general view is that you should use it as soon as it's received. Um, but in the case of, uh, for example, convergence time, you shouldn't issue, initiate a new transition. You should just new, use it the next time you need to use it. We wrote um, two um, templates, one for ISIS and one for OSPF. Uh, the templates are actually uh, kind of identical. Um, and were based on sub TLVs. And that's where I've had some, uh, some feedback. Um, so this is pretty much sort of vanilla ISIS way of adding an extra sub, sub TLV in and the same for OSPF. So what are the properties we required from this convergence timer, which is the thing that triggered this piece of work? Um, well, it must be consistent amongst all the, the routers in the network. Um, you really want to take the worst case, that is the highest value of the uh, convergence timer, so that even the slowest piece of hardware um, is ready for the next stage. Um, when you introduce a new router to the network, it must move, and, and if it's got a higher value, then you have to move to that. Similarly, when you remove the the slowest router from your network, you'd like the network to go to fall back. Otherwise, you end up in this bootstrapping sort of process that you can never get back from. So the idea is that you hunt for the uh, largest value in this particular case. Um, it could uh, change the, uh, the value if it discovered some reason for needing to change it, for example, a new line card, perhaps, or something. Um, if it's in multiple areas, it might need to run a different time of value in each of the areas uh, because it's got to worry about the time of value of its friends in uh, those areas. Um, how you figure out what the value is is outside the scope of the, the document. That's clearly highly hardware specific. 
Um, so what we were proposing for the convergence timer was uh, 16, um, 16 bits uh, of milliseconds. Um, we picked the largest one. Um, if we if the value changed we would use the new value but we wouldn't initiate a new transition what happens if a transition is in progress would need to is it needs to be defined um, the flooding scope uh, we set up um, there ie not leaked between uh, division between um, levels um, I think that's really all the key points so what do we do next so I had some feedback um, there's two. There's, there's two particular elements of this feedback. One is whether sub sub TLVs were a good idea um, or not, because there were enough identifiers um, uh, uh, at the um, uh, top level. The the other piece of feedback is well. So why does this need to be general? And um, I'm certainly very nervous about only defining one convergence timer because I can see, for example, we might end up needing an up timer, which is different from a down timer, um, and we may end up with multiple sort of repair strategies in the network, and they may need their own timers. But I'm also kind of nervous about um, once you move into this sort of space, whether we shouldn't solve the general um, problem. So I think there are three ways forward. We can remove this, we could stop this piece of work and just move it back into the MRT um, system. I could define just timers, uh, in which case I have to, we have to decide whether I define one uh, of these uh, per timer or whether I put a sort of timer uh, identifier in there so that we could have a, a set of timers um, or whether I pursue it as it is uh, on, uh, in the draft today. Uh, I think that was all of them, wasn't it? Okay, okay. Okay, I'll go ahead because I'm, I can't count. Hey, 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 yeah, we had this discussion. My initial uh, reservation was this about this was the generic semantics of this timer were two paragraphs, whereas these things uh, specific to the convergent timer, convergence timer itself, were the bulk of the uh, description. Uh, of this, you know, we're a page and a half, right? Why do we, you know, do we really gain that much by defining a separate class for this type of parameter that has to be synchronized? But then we also talked about in ISIS where you only have the 255 uh, types of TLVs in, in space. Uh, in that case, defining a separate hierarchy helps the starvation. And then if you're going to do that, why not have the same exact encoding? Yes. And it, it, you know, you're going to, it's going to be in different, uh, different containers because yes. they're radically different between ISIS yes, yes, and, yes. and OSPF. Yep. But why not have the same encoding? So I, I kind of came around and I said, okay, let's, you know, this is okay. This is okay with me to, to do it as well. I think we should I hear the see, counter view at the, some stage. I can see the advantage. Yes. I, I have no problems with sub-sub TLVs. I'll say that right. because we're recommending them in. In OSPF v3 extended LSAs, yes. we already have sub sub tier. Right. So, not that it's widely implemented, but we have them. Thank you. Hi, this is Uma Chanduri. Uh, I read the draft, uh, so um, I, I get a feeling that you got you're giving a laying out, you know, generic requirements for any new parameter. Yes. Not only for this, which is yes. good. And also, I got a feeling that you know it's not only for MRT for generic. Uh, 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 for convergence timer for you know yes. LFS, you know, want to reconverge. But what I what I see missing is basically um, there's no uh, there's no description of this parameter in relation to the current SPF hold down timers or delay timers. Uh, is there any relation actually? It's no discussion on that. Oh, so the 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 the, the only timer we wanted to the, there was a, there was a requirement to put in here. Is the one that needed to support MRT, and MRT would have its own definition of what it used the timer for. So this was you know, the reason for writing this was to, to 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 have the discussion about whether we needed a general mechanism or whether we should deal with this mechanism in the protocol itself. So if it is if it if you want to make it generic, I think a little bit more uh, details on you know what's the interaction between the SPF hold on timers, the trigger timers, current timers, and how you 
uh, whether it's applicable or not because it may not be applicable because uh, uh, for you don't know whether it you are reconverging or converging right first time so no no so i think so so first of all the convergence versus um um the, you know, the, the multiple phases of fast reroute, I think, will end up needing their own, potentially needing their own timers, which is why I was a bit reluctant to just define a, a mechanism that committed us just to a single value. There is sort of difference of opinion around you know, the various members of the uh, authors of the draft about this, but um, you know, I'm always concerned about pushing yourself into a box because usually I've discovered I'm in the wrong box. Um, so, but the definition of what the protocol does with this timer, I believe really belongs in the uh, protocol that owns the timer. This is just uh, about how you flood the value, the common parameter that you're going to use, and how you select that particular one from all the routers in the, um, in the network. But MRT, for example, would definitely own the definition of what it used that timer for. So finally, I got it actually. So in conclusion, like, you know, I like this idea to make it generic. Uh, I would like to see it make it generic and, you know, some more work on this. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Uh, Les Ginsberg. Uh, clearly, AC and I did not synchronize. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's ignore the, you know, the bits and the bytes uh, uh, details. Yes. I, my fundamental concern here is that you've demonstrated a requirement to advertise one at the moment and perhaps more in the future related to a particular routing feature, MRT yes. in this case. And you're choosing to do this by defining a container that could be used to advertise anything. Indeed. And given that we've struggled, perhaps not with complete success over the years, to confine the IGP advertisements to things that are related to routing, um, I object to, to the idea that suddenly we have to introduce something that has the potential to advertise anything we want. Well, I mean, it would only get, th I mean, I can set the um, the IANA considerations so that you get to veto anything silly, but MRT is definitely part of routing, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, no, no, I so, 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 This is a routing feature, right? This one definitely belongs. I'm not objecting to advertising this parameter. Right. Or even if you come up you know, and, next week with, oh, and, I need two or and, three. But and, why do we have to say, oh, just because I like generic designs, I'm going to define a TLV or a sub-TLV that can advertise absolutely anything? Well, it can only advertise, ab, 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 it can only advertise things that it's got an I own on a code point for, and we can fix how but, easy it is or hard it is to get one of it, those. That is not the way I read the description. All right, so I can so. I can set I can change the Iana considerations if to um, allay any fears about uh, Shakespeare going around in um, ISIS as well as in as in IDR. Oh yeah, let's no hats this time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I just wanted to respond to the comment about the controlled convergence just for MIT. And when Stuart and Mike and I talked about this initial idea, it was to handle some of the microloop prevention stuff and so on, and there's still other use cases where it is useful in that space. So that's part of why it made sense to pull it out, to me at least, to pull it out from the MRT work. I don't see that piece as confined to MRT, otherwise we'd just leave it there. So let's see where we are. We need a we, 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 there is a universal um, so I think I believe there's consensus that we need a timer for MRT because actually the protocol says it needs it. First, I guess my first question is: Is there a consensus um, for having a method of defining more than one timer? In other words, do I just have a single value, uh, just solve the MRT problem, and then come back and ask for another identifier, or do we solve the problem uh, for um, multiples? Um, so, so I think at this point, there's not, based on the text. Les has, has said that, you know, has made reasonable objections to it. Um, so you might be able to allay those by just, you know, by adjusting the text. But with the current text, no, there's, there's not consensus, I would believe. Although that would be Jeff's decision to, to no, call. I'm talking about whether there's consensus on the specific mm -hmm. text in the draft today. What I'm trying to figure out is what the draft needs to look like tomorrow. And I think there are three things we could do. We could uh, just have it deal with be the MRT um, time, okay. the MRT timer. 
um, mm. uh, definition, we could be we could make it a convergence, a general purpose convergence mm -hmm. timer definition where we may want more than one, mm -hmm. or we could make it a universal parameter um, right. protocol. And I'm trying to figure out which. So, of those so I think what I heard from Les was that potentially by adjusting the IANA considerations text to be much clearer about what is allowed to be put in here and what the procedures are, we may be able to to allay those. Yes. But that's not guaranteed. Is that correct or not? I think it's close. Uh, I'd just like to, let's not spend time here okay. debating whether we use a sub-TLV or a sub-sub-TLV. Right. We can do that on the list or offline or what have you. I just think you, if you're going, if you want a container that you're saying, gee, maybe I need three values tomorrow. I, yeah. I don't have the foresight right now to yes, know. Yes. But I think you, you do know that this is functionality related to a particular technology. And I think that's the way the definition ought to be uh, proceed. Not to define a generic container that could be related to who knows what. Okay, and is that, I mean, what, I'm try, what I was hoping to use the working group time on was to try and understand what the consensus of the working group in terms of full generality versus just defining some timer mechanism. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think we got quite a lot of feedback right. on, you know, it wasn't on the RTGW list, it was on OSPF and ISIS lists on this. Um, and so I think another rev of the text okay. to an offline discussion about it would uh, would be reasonable. Okay. I think I think... They haven't completely rejected the idea of, you know, more or less what it's like right now. Right. So try another version of that. Okay, let's just hear what AC says. On that. Okay. AC Lindham. Uh, what, I, what I think the most general version of it right now is any parameter that needs domain-wide synchronization. Exactly. That's, that, yeah, that that's, is, that's why I wrote that is, this. That is the most general. And... This, if you wanted to narrow it a bit, it would be domain-wide param parameter that requires synchronization associated with routing, and then you could take it from there. All right, okay. So I could, I'm could. i more than willing to sort of to do that if that's the consensus. Uh, Umar Chandra again. So I feel it's, the parameter should be specific to FRR technologies. It could be MRT or it could be another LFA technologies. It's relating to uh, reconvergence of LFAs, like, you know, and, I think if you narrow it down to that way, that'll be good. Instead of putting generic uh, parameter. Okay. I, I, I mean, I think you lose. I think we lose a lot doing that. Yeah. I'm not sure I agree with that. Like I said, uh, yeah. I, I think limited it to routing. Would be right. Okay. Well, I will definitely limit it to routing, and then I'll have. I guess we'll have a discussion on the three working groups as to whether this is the right way to pro proceed or not. Does that work? Yeah, so there's definitely no consensus yet. So additional discussions required before right. we proceed. Uh, there are a number of drafts going out through IGPs. All of them do a single thing, the advertised capability of a not. So it would be good to see alignment across all those advertisements because at the end, even so they go into different containers, they, they have same functionality to do you're capable of something in a particular way. Yes. So it would be good to see alignment across all of them. Thank you. Hello? Is that right? Ah, uh, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, this is a self-destruction button. <laughs> so Jeff says he gave me this device that he will trigger that is kind of exploding when I get overtime because of people not keeping on time. So this is a new device that they're going to use in this working group for a test in coming meetings. Keeps you honest. No, it's actually forwarding slides. I'll see if I can, I can work it. So I'm going to talk about Flexi uh, in the context of the routing area a little bit. 
Um, Flexi generated a lot of drafts for the various working groups, and then eventually we got together and looked at each other's drafts, and then we said, no, we didn't think of that, all of us. So there were kind of an, an overlap, but not completely. So we ended up with one draft that actually goes to C-Camp, and it will be discussed in C-Camp, on Thursday, I think. So this is a kind of a preamble to that. So Flexi, and I've been thinking, I did an update of my slides uh, yesterday and thought I sent them in and then I sent them in very late. But I still think that the first sentence here actually gives you a wrong impression. It gives the impression that the YF is defining a new data plane. And that's not true. They actually are tweaking the parameters on the existing Ethernet uh, data plane and actually aligned pretty well with what's going on in ITUT. So Flexi basically gives you a way of decoupling the bonding between the uh, Mac and the Phi in the Ethernet. And uh, when it were invented, it was uh, one scenario and was actually, and you should remember, Flexi is in the uh, high band or very high band with uh, area. So it was um, kind of created for OTN. When we, with our uh, ITF uh, perspective, started to look at it, we saw that there were other uh, uses for this. So, uh, the scenario we see that we can actually run Flexi uh, over uh, between routers and connect them, and that actually triggers once again, both for the OTN and for the routers, it triggers uh, the need to have a control plane for that. So, those three pictures are going to. So, Disclaimer, this is my understanding of what this Flexi will be doing, and there will be some animations that are coming up soon. Uh, so what we had before was that we had a, a coupling between the, uh, the Phi and the Mac. So the Phi had uh, one bandwidth and the Mac necessarily had the same. Uh, when I did the slide first, I put uh, some figures in, uh, and the people said, well, wait, what does that mean? So I, I hear going to pick a random uh, Greek character and put in, uh, that representing the bandwidth of both the Phi and the, and the Mac. So what you can do with Flexi is actually decoupling between uh, the Phi, so you can do, have same bandwidth in the, fi in the Mac as you have in the Phi, you can have more, you can have less, and you can bond one, two, three, four, or many. Typically, on a, um, uh, if you want a 100 gig uh, Flexi group, you need to have like 20 different uh, uh, phi, phi groups. And what I see is that we can actually go to this also in the future. Uh, this is not supported today, but we could have um, uh, files with different bandwidths actually being concatenated into um, Max. This is for future study. So, uh, we had a discussion on hard pipes. Hard pipes is defined in RSC 7625. It's an independent draft, actually describing an implementation done. Uh, but recently we started to look at this and we also started to look at IP hard pipes uh, in the context, uh, mostly in the context of TV distribution. Uh, so uh, we will uh, publish a draft on that uh, as, soon, as soon as, uh, not true, Sometime, sometimes after this meeting, it will take us a couple of days. Um, so, um, in we, we, sometimes we need to get, have guaranteed bandwidth. 
uh, and hard pipes is one part of the solution. Flexi is another uh, part of the solution, actually uh, helping us to create the hard pipes. Um, so, uh, looking especially at uh, TV distribution, we can improve the uh, QS parameters in, uh, in this type of network. See if I have the... So, the work will start in uh, CCAMP, but the work, the work we pulled into um, uh, one single uh, draft going to CCAMP actually were targeted for more than one uh, working group. I think there were at least three, maybe four working groups. And I think that will actually rebound and uh, uh, start have an impact on, on um, uh, for further working groups. Um, so we have a um, draft called Draft ISETH, CCAMP Flexi. Uh, it uh, gives you, uh, we have scooped that draft so that it actually gives the entire from use case to applicability statement or whatever. Solutions in there, framework is in there. Uh, and um, I, I think uh, I think it will be necessary to break it up and actually take it to different places. Uh, and then uh, we actually introduce this to the IETF the flexi specific uh, terminology. And here is what I see. This is my speculation. Uh, what the impact uh, we could have at different working groups. Um, one thing that has been said that the, the um, Flexi is a new data plane. No, it's not. It's uh, the OTN data plane from ITUT and potentially also the MPLS data plane from ITF. Uh, so work around uh, MPLS side, the MPLS, uh, the, the thing that depends on MPLS actually belongs uh, clearly in the uh, ITF and there are working groups that could be um, uh, you be involved in this. The first three is quite obvious because we need uh, coordination with C between CCAMP and MPLS to do a kind of packet uh, uh, control plane. PCE is needed. I think um, there is a work that we probably want to take the routing, routing, routing working group that actually is on um, hard pipes, IP hard pipes for uh, uh, unicast and multicast. Detnet is certainly within the picture. Uh, and then we need uh, capabilities to, ex uh, uh, to announce uh, capabilities uh, in, uh, in routing protocols. And TEAS owns the signaling architecture. So there is an overlap between a lot of groups. I'm not saying we're going to do work in every working group. I'm just saying that we need to be coordinated between the working group and actually agree on where the work is done. Was that it? Yes. Right. Okay, thank you. Questions? And actually, really, the questions should, uh, in this stage, actually go to uh, the work starting up in C camp on, on Thursday. Thank you. So this was the last presentation for today's meeting. Thank you and see you on Friday. So last presentation is not online yet. At the moment, upload or works again, I'll upload it. Thank you.